Good morning to you, Richard. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, did you think when you first wrote uh, The Selfish Gene, when you wrote The Selfish Gene, that your writing career, your subsequent books, would put you in the position which you occupy today? It's always very difficult to answer a question like that. Um, I wanted The Selfish Gene to be a popular book. In an jocular way, I referred to it as my bestseller before I actually published it. Uh, and it did sell pretty well and has sold pretty well over the years. Um, yes, I mean, I think that communication of science is an extremely important responsibility of scientists. I think it's a good idea for more scientists to do it and to more or less consciously set aside a certain proportion of their time and effort into uh, telling people what it is that they do. And, and I guess you couldn't be accused of not working to your job brief. You are the professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford University, um, suggesting indeed this is uh, your professional mission in life. Yes, I, I actually retired a few months ago as professor of the public understanding of science, uh, but that merely spurs me on to redoubled efforts. So was the idea of writing uh, to share your knowledge or expand the wider public consciousness about matters of science? I think that it's possible, and I tried to do this, to write books which are simultaneously addressed to the general public and to scientific colleagues. I've really never understood why people sometimes make a separation between those two. Uh, if you read scientific papers, they are often pretty much incomprehensible, even to other scientists in slightly different fields of science. And I do think that the discipline of writing for the general reader actually improves the way we communicate to other scientists. And you may even improve the way you think if you force yourself to explain it carefully to somebody who doesn't already know a lot about it. You may actually find yourself thinking more clearly about your own science, and that may actually improve your communication to fellow scientists. What, apart from book sales, is your barometer for whether or not you're achieving that? I get a lot of letters from readers, uh, many of them very nice, friendly letters, some of them not so friendly. Uh, I suppose my barometer is, uh, am I getting through, am I being understood, and the letters usually indicate that I probably am. Um, on those occasions when I'm not understood, I try to uh, write back with uh, some sort, of, um, some sort of, of clarification. Looking at the way your work has progressed, particularly, I guess, looking at the God delusion, it could in some ways be seen as a work that answers your critics. So you write these book, books about science and evolution, which by their very nature engender a strong reaction from certain people. Was the God delusion in any way an attempt to respond in a very meaningful way to those who criticised you and your work on evolution? Well, I wouldn't say it was mo so much a response because I hadn't actually written a book about religion before, although it does come up in many of my, in many of my other books. Um, I suppose that the, the world is rather dominated by religious considerations today, and somewhat increasingly so. I, I wrote The God Delusion uh, at, at a time when, um, when America had been dominated by George Bush for quite a while. And religion was rearing its head, I didn't quite say ugly head, but rearing its head uh, rather prominently in America. Religion's rearing its head very prominently in the Islamic world in a way that nobody in the world can afford to ignore. Um, as a scientist, I do feel very strongly about the truth. I value the truth. I, I'm in intensely curious about the truth of the universe, about life. And religion does offer a kind of alternative interpretation to the scientific interpretation. That at least would be my view. It wouldn't appeal to everybody. And therefore, I did feel a kind of mission to try to communicate the scientific worldview. And that, I suppose, in a way you could say, therefore, it was a response to the religious alternative. 
was it an attempt in any way to deliberately court controversy? Because it certainly has created some, hasn't it? No, I, I, I never deliberately go out of my way to court controversy. I think actually the controversial aspects of the God delusion are somewhat exaggerated. Um, there's a, a custom grown up in our society that religion is kind of off limits to criticism. And therefore, if you offer even quite a mild criticism of religion, it tends to sound much more negative than it really is. So if you use the sort of language that would sound really very mild if you were, say, criticizing a, a play or a book, but if you use that kind of language of religion, people hear it as though it was much more critical than it really is. Why do you think it is important now that as well as generating greater public knowledge of subjects like evolution, that society should be engaged in debate about religion and the part it plays in our society? Well, as an evolutionary biologist, I do feel rather in the front line of controversy. It's not entirely clear to me why, of all scientific ideas, which, which are equally well established, uh, the subject of evolution has been so, um, so much disputed by, uh, by religious interests. And so I think that of all scientists, an evolutionary biologist has perhaps the greatest incentive to respond to religious criticism. And many of my colleagues working in the field of evolution have been involved in attempting to refute the really quite extraordinary opposition to what is in fact a very, very well established uh, scientific theory. Well, when I say theory, it's actually a fact. But there seems to have been this transition in your public persona, most certainly, from being an advocate for evolutionary biology and for the work that flows on from Darwin to becoming a torchbearer, if you like, for a secular society, for becoming a champion of atheism, somewhat removed from your, your original starting point. My view is that they do go together. Not everybody does think that. There's a, a very strong movement to try to say that there's absolutely no connection between atheism and evolution. And I think for political reasons, especially in the United States, uh, for political reasons, people have attempted to downplay any controversy that there might be and have attempted to say evolution and religion are totally and utterly compatible and they point to um, pr prominent scientists who, who are also also religious. I actually think that there is something of an incompatibility. It can't be a total incompatibility because, as I've just said, there are religious scientists who, of course, do believe in evolution. Nevertheless, I do think that if you really steep yourself in evolutionary biology, really understand it in your, in your innermost being, that does tend to undermine religious faith. All right, let's talk about your faith, if you like, or indeed uh, lack of it, and I know you have faith in the logical and the rational and, and the observable world. Um, Liz Rawlings writes, she says, do you think a society without religion could actually function, or does religion always spring up in some form? W would you like to see a world without religion, or not? Well, that there are two questions there. One, one is, does it, as a matter of fact, always spring up, which is a question about human psychology. And there's also a, a, a hint in, in the question about would it be a, a good thing, which is an entirely separate question. Um, whether or not it would be a good thing, um, it still is a, a, a matter of, of fact, whether or not there is a God. And therefore, uh, I am myself more interested in the first part of the question, which is, which is, is it... Is it, is it actually true um, that, that, there is a, that there is a God or not? And I, I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, would uh, the world be, be a better... Sorry? In a place? Uh, I was going to well, say, is it possible there's a faith gene that explains God? <laughs> faith gene, I, I'm not going to... Uh, you, you're not expecting me to sort of give a, give a simple answer to the question, is there a faith gene? Because, well, as you know... Would you entertain know, the part would you entertain the possibility in a scientific sense? Okay, let me, let, let me give the, cor the correct sort of um, scientific answer to this. There are very seldom any simple genes for simple effects like that. So, no, you're not going to find a faith gene, certainly not in the sense that if you've got this gene, you're going to be religious. 
what we actually mean by something like that is, is, is there a genetic component to the variation in individual humans? So if you, for example, I mean, one way to test this would be twin studies. What you do is you look at identical twins, monozygotic twins, who have all the same genes in common, and you compare them with fraternal twins who are just like ordinary brothers and sisters, and you say, is there a tendency for identical twins to be more alike in their religious beliefs than for non-identical twins, or indeed for just any old random members of the population. If there is, if say, if one twin is a religious maniac, does that enable you to predict that the other twin almost certainly will be as well? Then that does give some indication that there is a genetic component, especially if the twins have been brought up separately, which in a couple of dozen cases, known cases, they have. And there is a certain amount of evidence that, uh, like most characteristics, identical twins tend to resemble each other in their religious beliefs more than non-identical twins. But that doesn't mean there is a faith gene. That means that there is uh, a genetic component which could be contributed to by lots and lots of genes. It certainly doesn't mean that it's inevitable. It certainly doesn't mean that if you're a religious person, there's nothing that can be done to cure you because it's in your genes. That isn't the case. I am presuming, and you have all confirmed this evening, that you, you write to inform, to stretch our minds, to, to broaden um, human knowledge. As their minds about things. Special from uh, Daniel Schiller says, you're frequently criticized for being a fundamentalist atheist. The implication is that your mind cannot be changed. Could you give us an example of a stance you once took very strongly only to have your mind changed? It would be interesting to hear an example of what kind of evidence would convince you, for example, to change your mind on the subject of God's existence. I think it really is an important difference between a fundamentalist who, who will not change his mind whatever happens and a scientist who is thoroughly open to changing his mind if new evidence comes in. I would be delighted to change my mind on indeed anything if, if new evidence comes in. Now, your questioner asks uh, for an example of a case where I have changed my mind. One would be the theory, the so-called handicap principle. This is getting a bit technical and nothing to do with religion, but there's an extremely interesting theory in my field of, of behavioral biology and evolutionary biology called the handicap principle put forward by an Israeli biologist called Amos Zahavi. And in my first book, The Selfish Gene, I more or less ridiculed Zahavi's idea. The idea is essentially that things like peacock's tails, that bright showy advertisements, not only are handicapped to the peacock, but, are, but evolve and are naturally selected precisely because they are handicaps. The peacock is in effect saying, look what a good, fit, strong peacock I must be, because I've managed to survive in spite of carrying around this ruddy great tail on my behind. Um, so I must be a really strong peacock, and that's supposed to impress females. Well, I wrote about that theory in The Selfish Gene in 1976, and as, as I say, ridiculed it. But then later, a student of mine, a very clever mathematical biologist called Alan Graffen, uh, did mathematical modeling of Zahavi's idea and demonstrated that actually, contrary to my earlier belief, my earlier feeling, it would actually work. It is theoretically sound. And I, I very publicly changed my mind in the second edition of The Selfish Gene and essentially um, apologized to Zahavi for uh, having well, we almost produced him in, in the first edition. So, yes, you are willing to change your mind in the face of evidence, hard evidence. Yes, and delighted to. I mean, I think it's one of the most exciting things is to discover that you have been wrong and to, uh, and to publicly come out and, and admit it. I mean, I tell the story in The God Delusion of an, an elderly professor in my department when I was an undergraduate at, at Oxford who had for years been teaching us something v very, very strongly. It's a, a very strong belief that he'd held on the basis of, of the evidence that he'd gathered. 
And an American biologist came to give a, 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 a visiting lecture, a research talk in the, in the department, in which he comprehensively showed that, that our old professor was wrong. And our old professor promptly at the end of the talk strode to the front, shook him by the hand and said, my dear sir, I wish to thank you. I have been wrong these 15 years. And we all clapped and clapped and clapped. This is exactly what a scientist should do. Uh, I once again want to come back to this issue of religion. The next book, is that going to be, if you like, in the same vein as The God Delusion? Or are you looking to get back, if you like, to your roots? I think it's more... I mean, the, my, my next book is called The Greatest Show on Earth, and it is... A, a, the subtitle is The Evidence for Evolution. Uh, it is a book about the evidence for evolution. The, the, the real title that I wanted to call it was Evolution, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Only Game in Town, because that was a T-shirt that somebody very kindly sent me... Um, unsolicited from America, but the publisher wouldn't let me have the only game in town, so it's called The Greatest Show on Earth. It's about the evidence for evolution, so it is almost entirely about science. It will be seen as against religion by those people who think there is an incompatibility between science and religion, which does not include the sort of orthodox view of the, certainly of the National Academy of Sciences. I don't know whether the Royal Society of New Zealand has a, has a view on this, but uh, for those people who do think that there's a conflict between evolution and religion, I suppose to that extent it will be seen as an anti-religious book. But no, it is a purely scientific book. Is that debate clouding your ability to write about what you want to write about? Are you sidetracked in some way by those who oppose you? Well, I'm not sure about me personally. It's certainly true that it, many of my colleagues, especially in America, again, I have to say, are sidetracked and indeed have to waste their time uh, instead of time that they could be devoted, devoting to studying evolution, going out in the field and doing their research and writing books about their research. They do have to waste their time fending off, fighting off a, a sort of yapping chorus of, of, of ignorant dissent. And, and that is an unfortunate side effect, and it is an unfortunate time waster. Some of those people would take that comment to say you also think an awful lot of people are wasting their time going to church on Sunday, praying to Allah, um, doing a whole lot of other things that don't really, when you boil it all down to it, have a lot of rational explanation for them. Do you think they are? Yes. <laughs> I think I do, yes. <laughs> You say it with a smile. Um, as a retired Oxford don and, and you know, a, uh, an incredibly widely read author, but aren't you laying down a very, very revolutionary clarion call to people, and that is to get rid of religion? If you think about it, all the religions of the past have already been got rid of. Uh, once upon a time, the Romans believed in Jupiter and Mars, the Greeks believed in Aphrodite and Zeus. Uh, the Norsemen believed in Thor and, and Wotan. Um, lots of other, thousands of other gods have been believed in. They've all been got rid of. Um, what's wrong with getting rid of one more god? Would you see that? Or oh, gods? Yes. This would appear to be an evolutionary pattern then. <laughs> Yes, it would be nice to think uh, that natural selection will finally... Have, it, it is not, of course, real natural selection, but it's a kind of analog Well, I put it selection. to you, the very fact that religion in some form has survived suggests that in an evolutionary context it has some benefits. Well, I'm not sure about benefits. I think it certainly does suggest that it has great psychological appeal and uh, that would be enough for it to have survived. Uh, brains are very complicated things, and what survives in brains, what survives in culture, is what it, is what it takes to, has what it takes to survive. And religion clearly does that. I mean, it clearly greatly appeals to people. It offers co comfort, it offers consolation, it offers reassurance that you're not going to die, it offers reassurance that... And uh, what's that wrong you... with that? Nothing wrong what's with wrong it. With and that? I'm, I'm just explaining to you why it is that it survives. I mean, a, a thing survives because people like it. Now, I didn't say there was anything wrong with that. Uh, I think, as a matter of fact, it's probably better not to 
um, take as your criterion for what you believe that which is comforting and consoling. I think I'm at least one of those who would rather believe that which has evidence going for it rather than that which just makes you feel good. But uh, I'm not going to stand up and say you shouldn't do whatever you whatever it takes to make you feel good. Um, my own suggestion would be um, be interested in what's true, but I wouldn't wish to uh, disabuse somebody who's who has spent all his entire life gaining consolation from, from religion. I don't want to suddenly pull the psychological rug out from under his feet if that's what he, what he likes. But, He's but free not to read my that? book. Aren't you doing that when you write, for example, uh, and I paraphrase, that you know, Catholics are going around brainwashing children and making them fear uh, you know, eternal damnation, and that religion as it is practiced is, is child abuse? Isn't I, that exactly that's another what matter. You I, mean, are saying to... I think that is extremely wicked to uh, go to a child, an innocent child who, who has no way of knowing better, and threaten that child with eternal flames of hell fire uh, for being bad. And many, many, many people. Uh, are, are go in mortal fear of being told of, of, of the things that they're told by priests, by parents, by school teachers, uh, especially when they're young, and it often lasts right into old age. That is nothing to do with allowing people to gain consolation. That is taking a child, and I think the word abuse is not too strong. It's mental abuse, not physical abuse. But I do think that teaching children about um, that they will after they die, they will burn forever in hell if they're bad. That is child abuse. And you would put it on the same par with bringing young men up to believe that if they kill the infidel, um, they will, you know, go to heaven and have, you know, X number of, vir of virgins to please. Yeah, them. I mean, I think I think that's also extremely wicked. I think that's probably a kind of political exploitation that's using. Uh, young men, ignorant young men, perhaps sexually frustrated young men, uh, and using them as weapons in a political struggle. Often, I suspect, the, these old men who send them, out, send them out on their missions, I, th I suspect it, it, it is cynical political manipulation. So, Richard, when you say you do not want to dis disabuse anyone of their faith if they've held it for a long time, can you name us an organised? Uh, can you name an organised religion that you think's okay, that doesn't in some way um, brainwash people, have them living in fear, or motivate them through completely illogical means to do terrible things? Obviously, some some religions are much worse than others, and one could single out um, w within Christianity, Quakerism, for example, is obviously far less uh, um, pernicious than say, Roman Catholicism or, 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 or Islam in these, in these respects. But when I said that I didn't want to remove people's comfort, the kind of thing I was meaning was, if I was visiting somebody in hospital on their deathbed and they were getting comfort from religion, I would not wish to remove that comfort uh, to, from su such a person or somebody's bereaved. I would not wish to go out of my way to remove that comfort. People are perfectly free not to read my book, but I write my book in the most honest way I can for those who want to read it. Do you think that uh, Western society as a whole is too tolerant, tolerant of religious extremism or those dangerous parts of religion which you identify? Well, I think there is a tendency for us to us nice liberal people to bend over backwards to be. I mean, I, I never want to knock tolerance because tolerance clearly is a is a virtue, but I do think that there's a problem with liberal nice people being so used to the idea that they should be nice to religion, uh, and because most of the religious people we meet are actually nice. I mean, they're bishops and vicars and people who are who are delightful, charming people, but by by treating what they preach with exaggerated respect, what we are in effect doing is making the world safe for those who wish to do very bad things on the basis of their faith. We're teaching people that faith is a virtue, that it is a virtue to be able to say, I believe X because I believe it because I believe it, not because there's any evidence for it. Now, the, all the nice bishops and vicars preach that. And once you've accepted that, once, you, once society has accepted that faith 
is a good reason, an acceptable reason, to believe something, then it's very hard for us to argue against those who say, well, my faith tells me to be a suicide bomber. My faith tells me to, bl to blow up a building, to shoot somebody, um, to do something terrible. And I think we've, as it were, sold the past by allowing the idea that faith is a virtuous reason to, to believe something. Another way to put it is to say that there is a perfectly understandable and even rational logical path that leads from religious belief to doing terrible deeds. It's very far from saying that all religious people do terrible deeds. Of course they don't. But given that you really, really, really believe that, say, Allah wants you to blow something up, you really believe, your imams have told you, your priests have told you, you've believed it from childhood onwards, that the virtuous, righteous, good thing to do is to kill somebody, uh, to be a martyr, then there is a logical pathway that leads from that. The people who blew up um, the World Trade Center in, in New York were probably all righteous, I did, hardly dare say it, but decent people. They actually believed that what they were doing was that was the right thing to do. And that was because they'd been taught from childhood onwards that the right thing to do was to be a martyr or whatever it, whatever it might be. So I do think there's a real danger in putting forward faith as a virtuous reason to believe anything. And to act in a certain way. Let's go from the extreme of, say, the 9-11 bombings to an issue, let's say, the wearing of um, a religious headdress in a secular school, in a secondary school that might have rules about what students can wear. Do you think that sort of religious tolerance should be allowed, or is that the thin edge of the wedge? The thin well, edge of the wedge, I should say. I... I don't have very strong views about school uniforms. I mean, I, I, I think that, that um, it, I could see a very good case being made for people being allowed to wear b b what they want or within reason what they, what they want. I, I don't think that, that a, a special exception should be made of, of religion. I think that um, if somebody wants to wear a particular something or other, because it was given them by their grandmother and their grandmother, for sentimental reasons, they want to wear it because their grandmother wanted them to wear it or something. That seems to me to be as good a reason to be allowed to wear something as religion is. I, I think I'm against the special privileging of religion. If nobody else is allowed to wear what they want to wear, why should religion be a free ticket? And you therefore also, I would imagine, believe that in a free society anyone should be pretty well allowed to say what they want about someone else's religion. Well, well thinking I, back we to, the, to the great cartoon controversy here, which we had some debate on here in New Zealand as well. Which controversy? I didn't hear that. Uh, the, the controversy over the cartoons, the, the uh, oh, uh, yes, Osama yes. bin Laden cartoons. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, we have libel laws and uh, we have protection, which I think is very right against uh, libeling and slandering individuals. You can't tell lies about people. Uh, you can't um, um, libel them or, or slander people. Once again, I don't think that religion should be granted any special privileges over anything else. Uh, it's one thing to say you shouldn't tell lies about me. It's one thing to say you shouldn't insult people uh, gratuitously. But to say that religion has some special privileged immunity to being insulted, I think that's that's nonsense. Um, I take offence at all sorts of things. I, I take offence at people chewing gum, but I don't think that's a sufficient reason to say that by law they should not be allowed to chew gum. Well, I don't think it's really a good, good reason to go and kill them because they do. Society has bought into the idea that religion is somehow special, and therefore uh, cartoons of Muhammad uh, are because they, in, they, they are said to give religious offence, that somehow this is any different from the sort of offence that we may take from things we don't like, like I don't like gum chewing. You therefore think at the moment we are too tolerant, too religiously tolerant in the West generally? Well, I don't like the phrase 
too tolerant. I, I just think that we shouldn't make a special case for religion. I think we should be tolerant generally, but we shouldn't be any more tolerant of religion than of anything else. Do you believe that religion in general is on the decline, on the wane? That your sort of rational thought that, you know, faith has had its day, if you like? No, I don't think that's happening. Um, I think it is true that the more educated people get, the more likely they are to give up religion. And uh, th that, I think, is a, is, a, is a good trend. But if you actually look statistically at the number of people who are religious, I don't think there's evidence worldwide that it's declining. Um, church attendance is certainly declining, certainly in Britain. I, I would guess in New Zealand, but I, but I don't know. Uh, I think it is in America as well, although it's much higher in America. It's not clear that, that the decline in church attendance is always accompanied by um, a, a general ration, rationality increase. It may be accompanied by a sort of belief in other sorts of nonsense like astrology and, and ley lines and, and woo-woo, things like that. Um, but I think when you, in the Scandinavian countries, for example, uh, religion has now reached an extremely low level and those are among the the, the most advanced um, societies in, in, in the world. I think there is good reason to hope there. Even in America, which is famously religious, uh, opinion polls are showing a steady and, and rather impressive increase in the number of people who state that they have no religion. Uh, and back to America, where some of your most vocal critics uh, come from. Ken Watt uh, from Te Aratu writes, he says, I'd like to ask, uh, how does Richard manage to remain polite to interviewers and religionists who continually prove themselves incapable of giving a reasonable answer to a simple question? Also, why is it that uh, even exceptionally intelligent people can be taken in by a religious book that even I, by no means an intellectual, can see was man-made? And I presume he's talking about the Bible rather than the Quran there. <laughs> I'm delighted that he, that I, I, I'm described as as polite. Um, I, I'd like to think that I'm I'm polite and courteous when, when, whenever I can be. Um, I, I am widely believed and often criticised for being strident and shrill and arrogant and and things like that. Um, I, I suspect that people who call me strident and shrill probably haven't actually read the God Delusion, which I like to think is actually quite a funny book. And and uh, and I I, I hope that people who have read it may, f may find at least that it's not strident and, and shrill. Um, how can it, the second part of the question was, was how can intelligent people be taken in by, as you say, probably by the Bible? I don't know. I mean, I think that many of the people who call themselves religious, it often turns out that they don't actually believe in the Bible or the Quran. It turns out that what they actually believe in is something that they would vaguely call spirituality or well, they, they, they have a sort of general um, feeling of, to use the cliche, awe and wonder at the universe and they confuse that with religion. I of course am, I wouldn't yield to anybody in my awe and wonder at the universe but I don't call myself relig religious because there's nothing supernatural about it. So a lot of the people, in, the intelligent people you meet who call themselves religious turn out really not to be religious in the sense that they believe in the sort of God who does miracles, walks on water and that, that kind of thing. There are a very few intelligent people who really do believe in walking on water and turning um, water into wine and, and that kind of thing. And those are completely baffling to me. I don't understand them at all. I can only think that their childhood indoctrination is so strong that it's impossible for them to, or very difficult for them to shake off. They behave perfectly rationally with respect to every other aspect of life. I mean, voting in elections, their economic policy, they handle their money all right, they know how to run their life, and yet they believe in dotty things like, uh, like a man 2,000 years ago turning water into, into wine. I think that's got to be something to do with childhood indoctrination. Did you have any? Any childhood indoctrination? How did you miss out? <laughs> Only of a mild sort. I mean, I, I, um, I was sent to Anglican schools, and um, the, 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 the Anglican church, the Anglican version of Christianity, is a very mild and attenuated strain of the virus. And so 
I was pretty much uh, spared, I think. Um, were you, anyone in your family religious? Have you had falling outs with, with, with um, friends and family over your views? No, no, um, no, no, no falling out. Um, my, my family, I think, are pretty uniformly not religious. What about colleagues? Well, again, I mean, occasionally uh, I meet um, colleagues who are, well, there are pl plenty of colleagues who are sort of religious in that vaguely spiritual sense, but the number of colleagues who are really properly religious, who actually believe that there's, a, there's an invisible person who listens to your prayers and forgives your sins and, and does miracles when, it, when the fancy takes him, um, very, very few of my colleagues really believe that. I, I once did an interview, I, I was interviewing uh, Jim Watson of, of Watson and Crick, the famous geneticist, and I said, do you, uh, do you know any religious scientists? And he said, I occasionally meet them and I'm embarrassed when I do, because I don't know what to say to them. <laughs> uh, some might think that without faith, without belief in miracles and Father Christmas and uh, perhaps UFOs and everything else, that you're a bit of a miserable bugger, that there's not much fun in your life. That is so that wrong. Everything. Exactly. Well, I want to... Yeah. Where do you get your joy and your passion from? Where do you find well, look, it? If... Most, I mean, I get joy from the same kinds of ordinary things that everybody else does. I mean, I won't list them, but, you know, I'm a human being living in a human society with a human family, and I enjoy the sorts of things everybody else in, enjoys. But you don't want to hear about that. Um, the, 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 the other thing is, why on earth should you assume that because you're not religious that therefore you should be a miserable bugger? Quite the contrary. We, we live in a beautiful world, a beautiful universe. We, the scientific worldview tells you about it, helps you to understand it, helps you to explain it, helps you to understand why you're here and what a precious thing life is. You understand how improbable it was that you should have existed it existed in the first place i am so privileged to be alive and so are you and it's it's science that tells you why you're alive science that tells you why you're here science that tells you why the world is here why the universe is here and that is a wonderful thing to understand and i could imagine going on for a lot more decades yes i know i won't but i would i would like to just learning more about it understanding more about it. It's such a worthwhile thing to do. And you would see that as the real miracle of life and existence? Yes, I mean, I wouldn't like to use the word, the word miracle, but it's far greater, far grander than anything that would be given the word miracle. Is it random, do you think, and you say we're all lucky to be here because our genes have passed down, something took, everything's okay. What sort of world would we have, for example, um, if Darwin had not been born? Oh, it, would be, it wouldn't be that different, because Darwin uh, just happened to be the person who laid it out uh, for the first time, and um, he did it in a remarkably thorough way. Uh, but as you probably know, um, inde independently, uh, Alfred Wallace had thought of the same idea, and Wallace would certainly have published the idea probably in 1859, which was when The Origin of Species came out. It wouldn't have had such an impact, because... Darwin wrote a book, and that book, The Origin of Species, is a remarkably cogent and beautifully argued, thorough piece of work. So Wallace would probably have just written it as a paper, and it might have fallen a bit flat in the way that actually in 1858, when the papers of Wallace and Darwin were preliminary, preliminarily published, they were actually just read out at the Linnean Society in London in 1858, and it did fall flat. People didn't really get it. They didn't understand what a momentous event had happened. It took the book, it took The Origin of Species to really hit home to people, and I guess Wallace probably would have got around to writing a book a bit later. But no, the, the world wouldn't be very different if, if Darwin hadn't lived. Darwin just did, did the job extraordinarily well. And if you weren't here, someone else would be writing a perhaps less entertaining treatise than The God Delusion and everything else you've written. There are quite a lot of excellent books, which I strongly recommend. Uh, Sam, Harris's, uh, um, Sam Harris's The End of Faith, um, Christopher Hitchens's God is Not Great, 
uh, Dan Dennett's Breaking the Spell, books by Victor Stenger, by Ayan Hersey Ali. There are plenty of books out there. The God Delusion is by no means the only one. We are going to, in a moment, uh, in a few minutes, hear about some New Zealand popular science writing. What is the greatest challenge to you as a writer of popular science? Um, where do you sweat most in trying to take sometimes these very complex ideas and put them in a way where most of us, most of the time, can understand them? I think it's very important not to dumb down. It's very important not to oversimplify. You need to simplify as far as possible without distorting. Uh, you need to be understood, and that's very difficult. And uh, I find a great deal of my time is spent reading over what I've written, more or less subconsciously imagining that I'm some somebody else. Some I, I, I may I may often have a particular person in mind. I don't systematically say. I'm going to imagine that, that, uh, that I'm um, my aunt reading this or something like that. But if I happen to have had a letter from my aunt that day, then it's possible that she will be in my mind. And therefore, when I'm writing that day, when I'm reading through my stuff, I may imagine that it's she who's reading. And I will immediately spot something that she wouldn't understand, uh, which, I, which I wouldn't have spotted if I'd imagined that it was the president of the Royal Society of New Zealand reading the book. It would obviously uh, be a, a different experience. But by reading it through again and again, through imaginary eyes of different individual people, I think it kind of gets filtered and filtered and refiltered, so that at the end it is uh, much more comprehensible than it otherwise would be. You constantly have to put yourself in the position of the reader. How could this be misunderstood? How might this be taken the wrong way? And, and if you do that, and you see it, and then you try to forestall that, and then you go through it again, then you see another way in which it might be misunderstood. It's very hard work. Science Are is still... hard work. Yeah, sorry. Are you still writing academically or, or not? Or is this the only writing you're doing? Less, than I, less than I used to. I mean, I, I occasionally get commissioned to write things, but I'm not doing sort of white coat lab research now. Any chance you would ever sit down and, and write a sort of pot boiler set at Oxford, go for pure fiction? Um, do you have any, uh, well, allusions or delusions? Uh, towards writing something else, perhaps more creative? I occasionally thought, well, uh, I mean, cre creative is what all writers have to be. Yep. Um, yes. But um, I I've occasionally thought about perhaps science fiction. I've never written a work of science fiction. I quite like science fiction. And I think science fiction is a very fruitful way of getting science across. There are things you can do in science fiction. I've actually learned quite a lot of science by reading science fiction. It kind of um, opens the portals of the imagination uh, in, in a good way. Who are your favourite? Who are your favourites? And I'm presuming we're not talking about Star Wars. We're going back to what? No, I mean, I'm thinking of, of people like um, Arthur C. Clarke, um, Isaac Asimov, um, Fred Hoyle even, uh, who, who I, I don't like a lot of what he writes, but his first novel, The Black Cloud, is a superb... Um, exposition of certain scientific principles in a, in a fiction format. It also has a very obnoxious hero, which is, which is a pity. It kind of mars the book. But if you set that on one side, it's a book from which I learned an enormous amount of just plain science while reading the novel. So that is a possibility, a, a science fiction book from you, Life on well, Mars? Well, possibly, or yes. I, I, I could imagine perhaps trying, trying that. But I, I've no experience at all in the art of writing dialogue, for example. Is it also not true that, in many ways, the field that you've chosen to write in, and as we discussed, this has developed from writing about evolution to sort of having to respond to people who say it doesn't match up with God, you are kind of stuck, perhaps, now having this argument for the rest of your, of your writing life, because it would appear to be an argument that has no end. I'd like to think that's an argument that has an end. Um, it's an argument where all the evidence stacks up on one side rather than the other. So it's not like one of those philosophical arguments where you're never going to get anywhere. Um, if people will honestly 
look at the evidence, honestly look at the facts and assess it uh, critically, uh, they will come to the right conclusion, which is that certainly evolution is a fact and uh, it's as firmly established a fact as really any in science. And um, it's, uh, the remarkable thing is that in the face of this mountain of evidence, there is a lot of opposition, really almost all of it from people who simply don't know any better. I mean, it, 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 is, it is ignorance. Ignorance is no crime, uh, and it's something that's remediable. You can combat ignorance by um, education, and it, it's hard work. Because, of course, your books aren't the only way, I guess, in which you address this. Uh, you've also got a website which I understand has massive amounts of hits on it and deals with these issues. What else are you doing in your life to educate, to win this argument? The website is richarddawkins.net and as you say it does get a lot of hits. It's a very lively, thriving forum of um, commenters who've become a kind of community, many of whom kind of have got to know each other uh, through it. It's a, it's a very flourishing place to go. Um, and it's, um, it's sort of a sort of central meeting place for this kind of talk. Uh, I, am, I founded a couple of charitable foundations uh, for reason and science, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, one in Britain and one in America for um, educational purposes and the reason for having one in Britain and one in, um, in America is that the charity law in the, in the two countries is rather different and so it's difficult for people to give money um, in a tax efficient way in, in the wrong country. Um, if anybody wants to start up a branch in New Zealand I'd be delighted to, to talk to them about it. Um, and, and the idea is primarily education as I say, education, not specifically in atheism, but education in, in reason and science. I'm passionately against indoctrinating children in any way, and so I would never wish, for example, to ever to talk about an atheist child, just as you should never talk about a, a Christian child or a Muslim child. You should, you should wince when you hear anybody say that. Um, so I don't want to indoctrinate. What I want to do is to teach people and children especially to think for themselves, to think critically, to ask questions, to say, how do we know? What's the evidence for that? I, I had an image of you reading some of your stuff a week ago of, uh, and you've, I'm sure you've seen the movie, Monty Python movie, The Life of Brian. Oh, and yes. I had a vision of yes. you standing at a window yelling to a crowd, I'm not the messiah of secularism, I'm a <laughs> bloody scientist. <laughs> Are you sometimes uncomfortable with, in some ways, the religious cult status that is building up around you in regards to all this? If that were happening, I would indeed be very uncomfortable about it. It's not something that I, that I would wish. I, I rather I like the comparison with, with Brian, uh, which is a, a, a wonderful film, by the way, a glorious yeah, film. I thought you'd like it. Yes. Um, so you're, you're not you don't see some hints that that is happening. Well, I would be very uncomfortable if it were. I mean, I would I would hate the idea of a cult. I hate the idea of of all cults. I want people to think for themselves, to think critically, uh, to think to think skeptically, and to examine the evidence, not to build up a cult. It doesn't answer the question. Do you think it is happening in some ways, though? No, I don't think it's happening. I mean, occasionally you, you, I get hints of something like that, but it, it's not happening in a big way. Thank you very much. We have one question. I have one more question for you at the end of the evening, um, but it is time now, um, Richard, for us to move on and uh, present this award. Uh, thank you very, very much for a most uh, entertaining discussion. Thank you very much. And I would now like to invite uh, to the lectern one of the judges of the Royal Society of New Zealand's um, inaugural um, science book prize, and that is Professor Jean Fleming uh, of the Kaga University. Thank you, Sean. Good evening, everyone, and good morning, Richard. It's an incredible honour to be up here today and representing the three judges of this wonderful book prize. 
And uh, I'd like to share with you, first of all, the comments that the judges made on the five shortlisted books that Dr. Guy McCarthy uh, told you about before. This time they're in alphabetical order. So the first one is Falling for Science by Bernard Beckett. From Plato to Popper, from Descartes to Dawkins, Falling for Science takes on science, philosophy, storytelling, and almost everything else in an ambitious and wide-ranging inquiry into the relationship between science and human meaning. The second one is In Search of Ancient New Zealand by Hamish Campbell and Jared Hutching. Comprehensive and engaging, In Search of Ancient New Zealand authoritatively uncovers the layers and myths of New Zealand's geological past, using clever analogies and innumerable illustrations, beautiful illustrations, to make the geology accessible. This is ancient Zealandia for modern Kiwis. The third book was Wetlands by Janet Hunt. A beautiful read and an exhilarating, evocatively illustrated guided tour through New Zealand's wetlands, those patches of lands we have so often underappreciated, overlooked, and even done over. Janet Hunt's Wetlands fuses geology, chemistry, biology, geography, and history into a poignant and inspiring work of environmental advocacy. Next we have the Our Book of New Zealand Science, edited by Rebecca Priestley. This time and space machine takes us from Pahutukawa to Polymer and into the hearts, minds and discoveries of New Zealand's scientists. The brilliantly edited Our Book of New Zealand Science presents a new perspective on the history of Aotearoa, recording and reminding us of the role science has played all along in our life and in our art. And finally, Hot Topic by Gareth Renaldon. Gareth Renaldon turns up the temperature on a hot topic that will almost certainly impact on us and on future generations. Timely, lucid, and very readable, Hot Topic explains the science of climate change and the wide range of its implications for New Zealand. Now, before I ask Professor Dawkins to open the envelope and announce the prize winner, I would really like to invite Di McCarthy, the CEO of the Royal Society of New Zealand, to come up on the stage again to present the prizes. Okay, now perhaps, Richard, you would like to open the envelope. The winner of the 2009 Royal Society of New Zealand Science Book Prize is The Hour Book of New Zealand Science, edited by Rebecca Priestley. Congratulations. Could Rebecca and Mary please come up? So while they're just catching their breaths, perhaps I should read you now the comments that the judges made on this wonderful winning book. The Our Book of New Zealand Science. This is scientific enchantment. It's a time machine that takes us into the times, the very words, the minds, 
the passions and the discoveries of New Zealand scientists. It produces thrill after thrill of recognition, surprise and inspiration. The eclectic mix of scientific writing, of letters and poetry, defies all stereotypes and opens up a world of curiosity, wonder and excitement. The essays offer us not just specific findings and insights, but also a kind of unofficial history of New Zealand, while the poems shine unexpected lights on the scientists and their subjects. Brilliantly edited to show the continuing place of science in New Zealand culture and art. Um, thank you so much. I'm surprised. I always kind of thought people got a little nod before a prize like this, and they'd kind of know. First of all, I'd like to say it was an absolute joy working on this book. I don't think there's been any project I've worked on that I enjoyed so much. Um, of course, I'd like to thank Mary Barnum, my publisher. It was Mary's idea that I'd do this book, and thank you, Mary, for choosing me. Um, Mary was fantastic to work with, as were all the others at Awa Press. And of course, I'd like to thank the Royal Society of New Zealand, to Di McCarthy and Faith Atkins, and to Glenda Lewis, who worked to put the prize together. And can I also say it's a great honour to have this prize presented by Professor Dawkins. Thank you. Um, and also, um, I'd like to acknowledge all the other finalists. I thought it was a, a great shortlist and an honour to be included with all those other writers. Um, and of course, to acknowledge all the um, scientists whose work is in the book. It's really about those guys. Thank you very much. Congratulations and uh, thank you again to uh, the Royal Society uh, of New Zealand for that. Um, and thank you for opening the envelope with such aplomb, Richard. <coughs> Two questions finally. Um, the first one a little cheeky. Have, uh, have any of your books been banned from anywhere? Have you reached <laughs> those good arts yet? Yes. Um, uh, the God Delusion was uh, temporarily banned in Turkey. Uh, and my website, I think, is probably still banned in Turkey. Um, Turkey seems to have rather odd laws whereby if any citizen goes up and says, I want this book banned, it's banned uh, until while well, they look into the question of why it should be. And so it's not that difficult to get a book banned in Turkey. Um, it, it was then unbanned again. Um, I don't think it's been banned anywhere else, but uh, I, I look forward to hearing if, if there are any such cases. And a final question, absolutely hypothetical, but I would like you to attempt to answer it uh, as honest, hypothetically honestly as you can. If your life absolutely depended on you having to choose a faith, to choose a religion, <laughs> which one would it be? <laughs> oh, goodness, I think it would have to be the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Um, Professor Dawkins, um, to paraphrase a, another media person in New Zealand, I do have to say this has been marvellous and uh, delightful. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. Uh, Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.